Well, good morning, good people around the world. Thank you for joining us. Now, you have joined us for Peak Off Wednesdays, and we are keeping it real. I am speaking with James Stevens Valiant, who I have spoken to all year about this magnificent collection of essays and several of Leonard Peikoff's other writings. And it's the week of Christmas. We've got the holidays coming right up. And James, you have chosen questions for us for this week and next week, already scheduled in advance, that are going to cap off this year in style. James, or how are you doing on this fine morning? I am doing spectacularly well, sir. Um, I really am. I'm feeling the uh, holiday spirit here, the, the happy winter solstice. It is yes. Birthday. Today is the birthday of the annual sun. And uh, from henceforward until midsummer, the days will start getting longer. So I, uh, the sun will get more and more sun as the days proceed for the next uh, six months. And that always puts me in a good mood. And it provides us a good time along with New Year's Day to get some perspective on history. And so the questions I picked today were from the uh, chapter Past and Present, uh, which conveniently allows us to have some questions here that give us some perspective. And the end of the year is a good time for taking perspective, I think. Outstanding. Yeah, that, that section of the book opens with the uh, words, what is left of the souls of Americans, even if they don't know it explicitly? Is the Enlightenment spirit still alive today, even if underground? Now, we're, we're talking on YouTube. We're talking over the internet. We're talking to good people around the world who I hope will join us in the chat using amazing technologies that are making it possible to spread these ideas far and wide. And the questions today are going to address that. But if you are in the chat, by all means, join us with your comments and questions. We would love to read those. If you want your comment and question to stand out, and especially if you'd like to support the Ayn Rand Center UK that brings you this content and so much other outstanding programming and events, put in a super chat. Super chat monies go directly to the ARC UK. You know, James, you and I are objectivists. So of course, we're also independently wealthy. We don't need that money, but the ARC UK does. So thank you very much for that. At the very top of the chat, you'll also see a link to become a member of the Ayn Rand Center UK. If you're not already, become a member of the ARC UK. And finally, you can join the YouTube membership as well. Now, before I, I'll mention that again before we're done, because I know everybody's eager to do it, but I want to jump right into the content. Because again, you've chosen questions that talk about, well, we've got all this technology, we've got all this science, all this uh, you know, applied reason, which our heroic businessmen bring to us in, in quantity, abundantly. But what does that mean for the spread of objectivism? And so Leonard Peikoff starts off this section with this question that he was asked. How does the growth of technology in the last 60 years correlate with the continued growth of evil philosophy and religion, which has taken place at the same time? And that's a great question. So Leonard Peikoff says, he starts off his answer with this. Well, these two trends are the exact opposite. The growth of technology is the development of the Aristotelian and the pro-science tradition since the Renaissance, while the growth of Platonism is the growth of religion, of Platonism becoming Christianity, which did not take place at the same time, but in the last 60 years has. And what it means, if this continues, is that the last elements of the Aristotelian tradition, including technology, are going to disappear. And the full triumph of Platonism is going to manifest itself. Well, this combination can't last. And it's pretty clear that there's no one defending the Aristotelian tradition. Well, that leaves what's going to happen pretty clear. And then he says, I work that out in detail in my book, The Dim Hypothesis including my specific prediction. And then a quick version, I think, of that he gives in the last paragraph here. A big thing, the big thing a religious dictator is going to have to overcome to succeed, though, is specifically technology and people's commitment and desire for wealth. The religionists have to overcome that before they can introduce a regime in which people will be poor. The movement to achieve that has now reached very big proportions. And then what is the movement he's talking about? That is the green movement, the environmentalist movement, the ecology movement, whatever you want to call it. 
That is exactly what the religionists need to complete their destruction of Western civilization. The fact that the two of them, the Greens and the fundamentalists, are joining hands is not only logical, I predicted it. Now, James, unquote, there's so much in that answer that I would love to hear your thoughts on, especially that last part, because how many of our friends and even people within the objectivist movement believe that oh, no, 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 the right is our bulwark against the left, or even the left is our bulwark against the right. And here, Leonard Peikoff seems to say, no, 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 the way this, this is going to work is that the environmentalists, and I love how he mentions the ecology movement, which is what it was called when I was young, same movement, just progressing. No, they're going to make it possible for the religionists to say, yes, it is true that we should live with less, that we should sacrifice more. They just have it wrong. And obviously it should be done in the name of the Bible. Yeah, we have noted before the fact that leftists, starting with Karl Marx going forward, uh, kept claiming that socialism would provide material abundance, technological progress, the path to you know, all kinds of wonderful uh, prosperity and success course of the 20th century was a dramatic, repeated uh, lesson in the failure of socialism and their un inability to deliver the goods, material goods in that way, technological progress or economic development or greater wealth, uh, failed miserably. So they changed tactics. Uh, they changed tactics because, let's face it, they were never pro-reason. They were never pro-civilization. And so the choice between the power grab and progress was a real easy one for them. They chucked technology, they chucked human progress, and they said the environmentalists supplanted the Marxists. No, material progress is evil. You don't want to be wealthy. You don't want technological progress. And now, of course, environmentalists explicitly <laughs> condemn technology, condemn humanity, in effect. Uh, uh, how dare you want to live a comfortable, prosperous, happy to, you know, life? How dare you want there to be scientific and technological progress? How dare you want to live a better life? You know, technology as such is man's tool of survival. It's the application of reason to the problem of survival. It's taking your reason and making it make a difference in reality. All of the things being equal, technology increases our power it increases our productivity. It increases, uh, gives us precious time, adds to our life. It, it, it improves uh, uh, convenience. All other things being equal, Technolo technological development is a great thing. It's the human means of survival. But technology as such, an, a product of technology, whether it's a computer, a gun, a printing press, uh, you name it, it can be used for good or evil. It's just a tool. A dictatorship could use a hammer, a computer, uh, any other technology that we develop, and they can use that technology for evil ends. Um, and so the technology itself is a morally neutral thing in that sense, in that sense. Uh, so the real question is the ideas ideas that of morality ideas in philosophy those will condition how we use the technology and by far more important issues than say technology's impact on society uh yes technology look the development of writing thousands of years ago the development of the printing press more than 500 years ago the development of the computer in recent decades have all greatly enhanced the speed with which we can now communicate around the world and advance ideas. If great, that technology is a great boon to virtuous people who wanna spread the right ideas, uh, all other things being equal. So as I say, technology is a wonderful thing. It's our means of survival. We've gained such power in doing it, but the technology itself can be deployed for evil means or bad means. And with the environmentalists, they've taken on technology as such. They want to take us back to, you know, if the religionists want to take us back to the dark ages, these new greens want to take us back to the Pleistocene era, uh, <laughs> the Stone Age, literally, literally. Um, so uh, in discussing this issue, I, I have to say, yeah, it's filled with, uh, Leonard Peikoff is filled with all kinds of wisdom there uh, on the power and possibilities of technology, but also the more important, urgent, and overwhelming issue 
uh, how we use it. And that's a question of philosophy. Yes. Uh, you know, thinking of this in terms of the Greens versus the religionists and the idea that eventually they'll come together. In so many ways, they already do. And with Christmas coming up, where are we, three days now, four days? Four days. And this is the time of the year where I start seeing the memes. Uh, Jesus would not want us rich. He would want us giving away our wealth. Jesus said, take care of the poor. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. And you can find a thousand quotes from the Bible with exactly that sentiment. Blessed are the poor. The Blessed poor are the poor. more fortunate than the rich. Yes. Because of the salvation consequences. You want to be poor here. Slavery is a salvation opportunity, says St. Paul. Uh, obey your harsh master, because think of the brownie points you're getting in heaven. Literally. Yes. Uh, Jesus said to the rich young man, give away all your money to the poor. Only then will you get into the kingdom of heaven. Yes, pay no mind for the morrow. Woo. For yeah, yeah, the morrow is spent in the clouds. That's and it. then up this life for the next, in effect. And even the pro-capitalists, the best these days that they can come up with outside of the objectivists is effective altruism. You know, well, we want to be rich so we can give more away, Ooh. so that we can <laughs> sacrifice and use all this high technology to be more effective altruists. Right, whereas it's their for-profit activities and selling computers that are doing more for the world, more to eliminate poverty and increase everyone's uh, wealth than their charitable activities could ever do. Right, and what the effective altruists will never in a million years be able to understand, at least until they embrace these ideas, is that it's not okay to embrace wealth and technology because it makes altruism possible. Precisely by trying to have it both ways, you end up destroying all of the motivations that make what we've got possible. We say, yes, we help the poor more than those altruists ever would, but that's not the justification. As soon as you make that the justification, you've introduced that poison pill. Right. I would say it's immoral for a rich person not to use the wealth that they have earned at least in large part, for their own pleasure, convenience, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> luxurious lifestyle. They have earned it. They deserve it. They'd be depriving themselves of the just rewards of their productive activities. Go spend money on yourself. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Use your earned wealth, at least in large measure, to make yourself happy. Yes. That's what it's for. <laughs> there's, there's, you know, when, when we say, and yes, that will help the world, better than anything else you could do. That's not the justification. That's simply pointing out the unity of values, the right. benevolent universe no premise. Yeah, exactly. yeah. there's no, no inherent conflict of interest That's right. among men who do not so seek the honor. When I see a rich person enjoying his wealth, that inspires me to be more productive and see what I can do to improve my life. Yes. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Yeah, if there's anything that casts your bread upon the waters, it is living a selfish life. Right. That is exactly what puts your capital, including your, your intellectual capital, out in the world. Incidentally, speaking of putting your capital out into the world, Apollo Zeus is in the chat with two pounds, sends a little love our way. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Kindred Amy wishes us a Merry Christmas and a Happy Winter Solstice as oh, well. Thank you. Thank you, lovely Amy. And question number two here, because, well, all this technology, sure, but are people spending all their time staring at their phone, listening to popular music? Is anybody reading anymore? So Leonard Pigoff was asked, do you think that objectivist philosophy will become lost as the younger generations become less willing to read due to our love of technology? And he starts off his answer saying, I don't think it is objectivism specifically that is involved here. All types of ideas and philosophies are available via the computer. What's going to happen as a result of the computer would be equal. I do think that eventually, if we continue on the trend we're on, all philosophies will be lost, but not through technology though, but through the anti-conceptual mentality that our youth get in school. The idea that broad abstractions are empty. Now, that's just linguistics. But that's all, that all that's real is concretes, pictures, what you see. It's that training that makes people want to look at television 
and computer games, for example, as a primary focus because they feel that reading or abstractions is something alien. The schools have taught them that. And he goes on a bit, but yes, that's, that's really the point is a lot of us read using a computer. Right. Uh, you know, we read off of our screens. A lot of people do audio books and I know people who are reading more than they would if they were tied down to paper. So I don't think it's the technology per se. I can, per, yeah, I can be sitting in a car on a taking a long drive. I could be in a waiting room of a doctor's office and read books now, multiple books, switch from this book to that book, to this magazine, to, to that newspaper's uh, website. Uh, actually, the computer allows us to read books on our computers, on our phones. It allows us to hear books, audio books, uh, if that's a, a way to absorb. I, I get more when I read the book myself. But if that's the way to get, even get the book, it's made it more accessible. You know, if someone said that the invention of writing, you know, geez, you know, we have, you can now write things down. But think of how it's going to devastate human memory. Right, you know, right. Things anymore. They'll be able to write things down. To but a all of that was true. But also think of what it did in terms of expanding our capacity to create new knowledge and spread knowledge. Yes, uh, that's a great it's point. What, I mean, it's what we you do with the technology. It's our yes. moral values that are really the critical issue here. It's not the technology as such. The technology gives us greater power to achieve our values. Yes, you can imagine somebody toward the end of the Middle Ages saying, "Oh, Gutenberg is destroying the world because knowledge is." obtained by oral tradition right. and handwritten words and the printing press is going to destroy knowledge so yes the forms change but they only make things more things possible uh leonard Pigov is exactly right it, it's education it's not technology that's the problem yes it's education it's philosophy it's the development of our own conceptual minds uh, the development of normative epistemology, the development of normative uh, ethics, so we know where our values come from. Th and it's those values that are going to shape how we use technology. Yes, yes. It, it's funny because the, the circles that I travel in might be uh, affecting this, but when social networks became popular, uh, sort of the heyday of Facebook three, five years ago, I would have friends saying, yeah, I just finished reading uh, The Man Who Laughs, and now I'm going to read, uh, you know, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I thought, these are the kind of people who seem too busy for that. And then it comes out in conversation. Well, I took it in on Audible, or, right. I, read it on, or I read it on my Kindle at my desk at work. And with all of these different ways of taking it in, I am seeing people in some ways taking in books they would not have read, right. but for the new technology. Exactly. And, you know, uh, uh, novels, uh, especially plays and poems, really do work on Audible for me. That kind of stuff does. And so if you can get some of the, you named a couple of the greatest books in all of Western literature, if you can get that uh, so much more convenient, think of how much easier. I'm glad you mentioned poems and poetry because I had a visceral reaction the first few times I heard somebody say, oh yeah, I took in 93 over the weekend. I thought you sat with a book for hours and hours. And then, yeah, I took it in, you know, on Audible. I listened to it, of course, because that's how I take in all of these books. And I remember kind of cringing a little because as you say, there, there are some things that you absorb much better off the printed page and you can stop and take notes or, or you can kind of skim and see what's coming next and find better places to stop. But you mentioned poetry and plays and talk about two areas where you know, maybe hearing the spoken word is better than reading it on the page, a really well-read version of a play and especially poetry. Especially. Well, see, plays are meant to be heard, uh, you know, orally on, from, you know, sitting in the audience from the stage, from the actors from the stage. Poetry in particular, the excellence of poetry is in fact in the sound, how it combines sound and meaning, as Dr. Peacock has explained. It, uh, so yeah, poetry and plays, are particularly good things to take in uh, by Audible, it seems to me. That's the way they're meant to be taken in. To be yes. Now, yeah, you shout out. I want to stop. And that so often, uh, this is mandatory for me in nonfiction books, I have to admit. If I read a nonfiction book, I need the time to stop, pause, reflect, think about that. If it's really important, make a note. Um, and you don't have that sort of uh, capacity to, to, to do that uh, uh, with. Uh, 
oral material, especially if it's a nonfiction book. Yes. I, that's my own perspective on it. Yeah. And completely or almost unrelated, uh, shout to the young people in the audience. If you read poetry, and you've never heard anybody give this advice before, because I learned this late in life, uh, you've got to read poetry out loud. Yes. Even if you don't, if you're reading a collection, even if you don't read every item out loud, stop every now and then and read it out loud in full voice. And I know that sounds like, oh, that'll make it better. No, it changes the entire experience. Poetry is meant to be read out loud. At least good poetry is. Good poetry, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Leonard Pigoff wrapped up that answer by saying, we have two philosophic trends here intersecting. Aristotle and his trend brought the whole technological world. Kant brought in, <laughs> brought in the whole anti-conceptual world and he is now in dominance. He is pushing back Aristotle and the whole idea of conceptual thought. Right now, his followers are taking the achievements of Aristotle, the whole scientific technological civilization, and using it to obliterate concepts. That is a horrible, horrible spectacle that you have to fight. And it's, unquote, and it's great that Leonard Peikoff understands. It's not the technology that's doing that. Right. No, it's, it's the way we are being taught in schools. And not just that we're being taught anti-conceptual ideas, but more fundamentally that we're being taught in an anti-conceptual manner and normalizing the idea that, oh yeah, this is how you learn or how you kind of pick up stuff. One of the distressing features of uh, our time is that our, our scientific knowledge of the physical world, our technological capacities because of that, and the uh, products that uh, business people bring to us as a result of that, they're really the critical uh, thing in bringing those technologies to some relevant uh, impact in human life. Um, all of that is um, based on, as he says, a tradition of Aristotelianism. And uh, that physical knowledge has way outpaced our knowledge of ourselves, our knowledge of the humanities and social sciences, starting and especially with philosophy. And philosophy, of course, has impacts for good or ill on his the study of history, economics, psychology, you name it, the study of human beings, the study of man. And uh, while we know we're still using ethical ideas that are thousands of years old, we're now, we now have nuclear technology. Within 10 years, we may have uh, effective uh, nuclear fusion giving us electricity. So with that, we're you know, flying to the moon and our machines are going to Mars. With that kind of power, with our technology, our m moral knowledge, our philosophical knowledge needs to do massive catch up, massive catch up. Human beings are their own greatest mystery. And you, it seems to me we're in a very dangerous position uh, because we're using moral and philosophical ideas as old as Plato and Christianity, uh, updated with a more powerful version in Immanuel Kant to govern a technology that all, this Aristotelian worldview has given us, this power over the world that our physical knowledge has given us. And in a sense, that's kind of frightening. You know, you've got yes. nuclear powers uh, coming from some of the most primordial dictatorships in the world, China and Russia, for example, who are armed with this state-of-the-art uh, nuclear technology. That terrifies me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the Kantian Marxist version of the caveman who comes across a 10 kiloton bomb and bangs on it with a rock. Right. Trying to figure out what to do with it. Right. <laughs> now, let's put those years together. The third question here, Leonard Peikoff has asked, well, is it easier to influence the culture today than it was 2,000 years ago or 300 years ago? So we're looking essentially Greek times and then Age of Enlightenment. And Leonard Peikoff answered, yes and no today. You have technology such as the internet which from that point of view enables you to spread ideas around the world like a lightning. On the other hand, you have, it seems to me, unprecedented corruption around the world, and especially in the West. So that's a much greater barrier. He says, it's like this. You have a fabulous radio station in terms of power of reach. 
but the receivers in the various homes are broken or only get static. Is that good or bad in terms of influencing the culture? Well, would you rather have a weaker radio and reach some people? Of course, not everybody is corrupt today, but balancing it out, I think it's harder today. Yeah. And it yeah. sounds about right to me. Think about what we're up against. Are more important than the technology. Yes. Potentially, of course, well, look, we're using the internet. We ourselves right now are using the internet to spread better ideas. And, we, and we're doing so and to an, nowadays to an international audience. We're reaching now across countries to do that. What a magnificent thing that technology permits us as objectivists to do. On the other hand, the power of technology is comparatively insignificant to the power of ideas. What's coming across the internet? What if we weren't here spreading objectivism? It would be the static that he's talking about, or anti-life ideas. It would be poison that was being spread efficiently across the globe. That's why I said earlier, the, tech, the power of the technology is wonderful, all other things being equal, but it, it is morally neutral. How that tool is used, a criminal can use a tool, a computer, a ladder, a hammer, a gun, you name it, uh, for evil. That same technology can be used powerfully as well for the good. Yeah, it makes me think of a um, PA system, audio amplifier, guitar amplifier, in which I can you know, stand in the front of an auditorium. And if I had an acoustic guitar in my hands and I played something beautiful, a few people might hear it. If I played something horrible, a few people might cringe. But give me a PA system and a few amplifiers and I can put beautiful music out to 10,000 people or I can make 10,000 people miserable. Miserable yes. and obnoxious noise. Yes. And that's what our technology is doing is amplifying yeah. our abilities. Exactly. But it really depends on what we put out there. Precisely. And I know so many of us have that experience, especially when we were younger, but maybe just in general, of wanting to find that magic argument, that expression, that figure of speech, that bit of logic that would take even the most closed mind and open it up to rational ideas. And where is that? I, and people will sometimes report, I found the one argument that always gets through, which, you know, a year later they realize, oh yeah, that wasn't working either. <laughs> it didn't work all the time. <laughs> because ideas don't work that way. The technology can amplify our reach. It's, it's magnificent that the Ayn Rand Center UK coming out of the United Kingdom has become global. I would say there's probably more of a presence, for example, in the United States than there is even in our mother country right. using these technologies, but it's only through the actual ideas and the, the efforts of the individual people involved. What makes the ARC UK work versus you know 10 other organizations that have tried the same thing and had only varying levels of success well, it's because of the, the deep values and motivation of Rosie Ginsburg, the technological know-how of our producer, Daniel, uh, the, the individuals, uh, hosts across the channel, you know, people like Mark Pellegrino and Rucka, both of whom were successful already in life and even had some degree of popularity, a bit of fame there, uh, but who, you know, individual people. <laughs> You think of the uh, the earnestness and passion of somebody like right. Jonathan Honig, and Jonathan of course, Honig, right, yeah, and working with you, James. You yeah. know, given your experience and objectivism, your enormous wisdom, and your college level knowledge, but also practical, down to sense, down to earth sense. Um, that's what makes the ARC UK work. And I only say that because it's a it's a gratitude and goodwill time of year, and I'm especially grateful to be part of the organization. I'm especially grateful to you. Um, you know, um, we were, they were giving out awards for uh, objectivists uh, in a recent podcast. And the thing that disappointed me the most is that you were left out. Mm. My vote would have been for you and at least one of two of those categories, sir. I am so grateful for you, grateful for mm. your rationality, for your love of life, uh, for the benevolence that you share every day with us in the audience. Um, well, I appreciate that. I consider myself more of a slow trickle. Think of the fountainhead. <laughs> and, uh, 
you are a flood of values. You are a torrent. You are a hurricane of high values, sir. No, you. I yeah. deeply appreciate it. For folks and, like Amy and I, I can hear you know Darlene Love and the Motown singers singing, "Our day will come." But James, you were mentioned, and that was well deserved. It was good to hear that. I, th I think you should have gotten more props than you did, but. I know that uh, you are greatly appreciated. And again, across the board, because that got, they got it. I mean, Alex Epstein and Don Watkins, I'm yeah, always can't beat that up for those guys. Exactly. <laughs> they deserve that credit. <laughs> yeah, there really weren't any lemons there. Everybody who was mentioned deserved, <laughs> deserved the recognition. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, the, the power of what ARC UK does using the Internet. And, you know, they just had their annual celebration. Everything, you know, was in person. Speeches by the, the Lord and Emperor Rosie Ginsburg and then a party afterward. And so they're, they're still local. They're still in person. If you are in the UK, if you're in London, you need to be part of those activities. But what they do with the internet, what they do with worldwide communication, well, that takes me to the fourth question here. Because Leonard Peikoff was asked, well, is the internet the real hope for the future. And it would be easy hearing that question to be kind of dismissive and say, no, no, it just amplifies what's out there. But I love that Leonard Pigoff always surprises me a little bit because he opens with this. He says, well, I agree to this extent. It's a great tool for communication, for teaching, for spreading ideas and information. But by the same token, it's a great tool for spreading falsehoods and propaganda. Which is going to benefit most in the long run? Well, you could say that in the long run, truth is going to win out over falsehood. And I'd say yes. But how long a run are you thinking of? Uh, let me close the quote for a moment there, because he's answered this question several times over the years. And he, I love that he always gives the same answer, which is, yes, the truth does win in the end, or truth does win in the long run. Uh, sometimes they'll say eventually, but eventually can be a very long time. <laughs> and it, those poor people that live through the dark ages, poor people yeah. who live in dictatorships, you know, it doesn't do them any good to tell them, well, you know, 500 years. <laughs> Real, yes. We've got reason and reality on our side. <laughs> eventually we'll win out at some point. Uh, it's no comfort to someone who's actually suffering right now, is it? Yes, eventually can be a very long time or the old expression someday. Someday is a day that never comes. Right. If it doesn't come in your lifetime, then it never comes. So he goes on, the truth will win out if we're talking in terms of specific pieces of information. But that, though, depends on philosophy. It depends on what epistemology is guiding the people who read the Internet and judge the information and make sense of all the competing claims. Are they using a rational method? or an irrational one? Are they using an appeal to the supernatural to refute it or to the secular? Are they equating the secular with the skeptical? Do they believe in absolutes? The same quote unquote data can be given radically different meanings according to the philosophy that the internet user is using to evaluate it. Suppose for instance, you publish that it's been established that men, all men, including the poor, make more money under capitalism than men under socialism or the mixed economy, that they make more money, have easier lives, greater longevity. Well, you give a whole torrent of facts in support of these findings. That's not going to stop someone saying, well, I don't care how you benefit from a crime. It's still a crime, namely greed. Or, well, that's all very well, but these materialistic people have to be you know, controlled by the spiritual ones in contact with another dimension. Or, well, how do you know you counted them right? Maybe tomorrow it'll be different. The internet spreads ideas around the world. And let's say, although he says he doesn't know, that no dictator can stop it. But without philosophy, that's not a solution as such, or a hope. We've had the, I love this example he gives at the end. And uh, he gave a similar one in answer to another question earlier. He says, we've had the internet now for over a decade. Is Obama, he answered this one in 2009, is Obama the example of the new world that we get from spreading information? 
And if the internet doesn't help us in a decade, how long will it take? And what's going to do it? In short, you can't get around philosophy. You first have to have the means of thinking before the data is going to mean anything. And I really, I read this one sentence three or four times. And if the internet doesn't help in a decade, how long will it take? And what's going to do it? What is it that breaks through? What is it that's going to make the difference? <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. As you said elsewhere, you can't shortcut history through marketing, or in this case, no. technology. No, no, it's ideas. I mean, look how Donald Trump used Twitter to get elected. You know, at, at Twitter, he was banned from Twitter, and Twitter had their war with him, et cetera, and going on now with Elon Musk and so forth. And what difference will that make? I mean, if, if Elon Musk doesn't have the right approach, then how's it going to be any better? But the point is, uh, uh, Trump was actually a pioneer uh, in, uh, as a politician in using Twitter to get his wrong, evil, totally bad message across. We got Donald Trump in effect because Donald Trump used the megaphone of Twitter to get his message across. So it, 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 the, Twitter doesn't determine the content of what people are gonna say uh, and how they're gonna use it and whether a Donald Trump will use it to get elected president or someone better will use, you know, say, use it to explain individual rights and, and reason to people <laughs> and get a better outcome. Um, it's neutral on that, on that fact. And uh, if it, you know, 10 years when he, was, when he was right, let's say 25 years, there's been a widespread use of the internet now about our time. Uh, and ha have we seen any, major cultural change uh, because of the internet. We're working on it here at the ARC UK. We sure are. We're putting content on the internet, quality content that hopefully in the long run will win the day. Uh, but that's what you got to do. It's the content that's going to have the influence. The medium just speeds up the delivery. Yes. And, and I'm loving it. I'm loving the speed. I'm loving the amplification. I'm loving the way oh, yeah. that it happens faster. But yes, it really is a question of what is what are we doing faster? What is happening yeah. faster? What are we amplifying? In the chat, Jeremiah Goodman, who uh, is a ARC UK YouTube member, says, I forget who it was, but somebody, some famous Catholic theologian or other said, you have to read the word of God out loud reading to yourself doesn't count. Well, I would say the same thing about poetry. <laughs> I would say the same thing about plays, but I love that this technology makes it possible. He also pointed out that without the internet, I would probably still be an uneducated Christian. <laughs> so thank you for being an ARC UK YouTube member. And if you haven't been reading the chat, if you haven't been following that, Jeremiah is making a lot of good comments. Free trade is also in uh, with 50 krona and says, and he's got this in quotation marks, Truth will win out in the end. And he says, begs the question, is there actually an end? Well, yeah, the end can be a long time away. And end probably isn't the right word. We're talking about, about well, it's the article short the, ends. Yeah, the article, the end that I would yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> it's an end. It's a goal. It's a milestone that we will reach. But uh, Yeah, well, that gets to the whole front porch philosophy thing, too. The idea that objectivism is for living a virtuous life, not for enjoying yourself, but when you're 90 years old and you're on your front porch in your rocking chair, then you can finally say, well, now I'm happy. Now I'm proud of what I did. And I always, I shouldn't say always, but several times I've had to warn people, this is not what ideas are for that rocking chair should be every night when you get home from work that rocking chair should be while you are doing the work pride and happiness are not an end result down the road but they are what you feel while you're being virtuous and saving the world i think is going to be the same thing we are saving our lives as we go we, you know, apply your own oxygen mask before attempting to assist others this is an ongoing fight and it's for your own sake not for yeah, 50 years down the road, we save the world. Boy, did you say it. I mean, if, you, if the goal of your life is to save the world, which I question is a goal, then the only way you're going to effectively do it is by starting with yourself and changing yourself. Yes. Uh, let me correct the, uh, the order of values here. <laughs> I would like a wonderful world for my own selfish benefit, but I'm going to start with making my own life better. Thank you very much. Uh, for my own purposes, I make me better. Uh, and if a better world is better for me, which it is, <laughs> the only way I can start doing that is by 
improving myself. Yes. If philosophy is the love of wisdom, then it's the love in the moment. Or as I always say, objectivism is the first fully complete and accurate owner's manual for life. And we should be using it for that. Now, next week, we're going to get into this even more because we've kind of laid the groundwork here. And I think we're, we're going to be getting more and more into, well, what is philosophy for? And as we save the world, what does that look like? And this is going to be good because your next the next title of the next show already set for the 28th. And I know everybody's going to join us again for that. How to change the world. And this is going to be great. And we're kind of already hitting in some of it today because the technology is making it easier to do exactly what we know we need to do. When we spread these ideas, when we're on a mission, like the Ayn Rand Center UK, we are spreading Ayn Rand's ideas around the world. We are also using this as a platform like a study group, but a worldwide study group to further integrate these ideas for ourselves. So I can apply this to what I do every day, every night during my life. You know, James, you've talked before about how objectivism has changed your life. And I've made the point that there are people who've said to me, oh yeah, I discovered Ayn Rand's ideas. And she kind of affirmed what I already knew, but I didn't really change or learn anything from her. And that, that always bowls me over. There may be somebody out in the world for whom that's true, but usually to me that says, okay, you didn't really get it. <laughs> if these ideas are not, and, I, and I'm not saying maybe, you know, that you weren't already pro-capitalist, that you weren't already a rational person, but, but that's not objectivism. That, that's more like the short answers in each of five categories. These revolutionary ideas absolutely changed my life. Right. And, and I, life. Yeah. Life. They're living life. They're for enjoying your life and being successful here on earth. Like you say, you don't want to wait till you're 90 in a wheelchair to finally say, oh, I'm finally happy. No, 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 no. No, they make my life happy and they enhance my life from beginning to end if I'm doing it right. If I'm doing it right. Uh, yeah. What, an inter what a sad way of looking at it, too. But it is the ideas. Those people are not taking ideas seriously. They say, Ayn Rand you know, one nice ideas, but it just didn't have any impact on me. Do I, then I'd ask the question, do ideas have any impact on you? Do you take ideas seriously? Ideas will shape your emotions. Ideas will shape your life. It'll shape the society around you, whether you know it or not. So what the person is saying is, well, I myself don't take ideas seriously. So whatever ideas I happen to have absorbed around me, there's no option to not have philosophical ideas, we have to have a philosophy. It could be contradictory, grab bag, a mess of philosophy, but that's gonna be their operative philosophy if they don't take ideas seriously and realize the real world impact, both on their own psychology, their own life and how they live, as well as the world around them. Ideas are the most important causal factor, both in the development of a human soul and in the progress of human history. Yes, I'm just bringing up a quote from Galt's speech, which resonates for me on this topic, you know, from Ayn Rand. For centuries, the battle of morality was fought between those who claimed that your life belongs to God and those who claimed that it belongs to your neighbors. Between those who preached that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of ghosts in heaven and those who preached that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of incompetence on earth. And no one came to say that your life belongs to you and that the good is to live it, uh, unquote. And, and I, I may have had that implicit sense and I can imagine somebody saying, oh, I already believe that. That life, that your life, that my life, each individual listening to us right now out there, that your life is an end in itself you know, per anthem, it, it needs no further sanction. You are the warrant and the sanction. But could I have asserted that as, as with that same degree of clarity before I, reading Ayn Rand? Yes, my life is an end in itself. I need to produce, I need to trade, I need to earn what my life requires, but I don't need to justify myself. My life is an end in itself. Right. See, I'm afraid as a child and later as a teen, uh, Christianity and Kantian culture around me had taught me just the opposite. And I was convinced that unless I was serving others, I was morally insignificant. I was just a selfish, greedy, you know, who are you, you know, kind of thing. 
it was Ayn Rand right there that lifted from my shoulders all of that unearned guilt, all of that impossible, that impossible uh, ignore consideration of something I could never accomplish and ignoring the one thing I could accomplish, my own happiness and success. Uh, it completely reoriented me and took away horrible guilt, shame, all kinds of stuff that Christians I know are still walking around with. They feel badly because they uh, do something, anything for themselves. Yes. Um, it, it, they do. They simply do. Or they feel a little guilt. I've got to pay for that in some kind of altruism to others. No, you don't. No, you don't. Right. Like you say, Anthem, she says it so beautifully. Your life needs no higher aim to vindicate it. Your happiness is an end in itself, whether it's society or God or anything else. Uh, what is the point? It, it, life is an individual thing. You're an individual organism. I'm an individual organism. Happiness is an individual matter. And nothing can be more important than the happiness of the individual from his perspective. Surely. What yes. a liberating idea that is. If you don't take it seriously, then you'll be forever mired in guilt and these uh, mystical worries you know, about technology. Yes. One way or another. Now, because we're wrapping up a little bit early, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you a personal question. And I'm wondering if anybody out there in the chat, anybody else listening has run into this as well. During the most valued Flares Awards on the ARC UK, if you haven't heard that Daily Objective episode, go to the Ayn Rand Center channel on YouTube and give it a listen. But it seemed like the, uh, the MVP, of course, Yarin Brook comes up. But this year, the MVP, Alex Epstein, amazing the work that he has done spreading the ideas of self-assertion in regard to energy rational perspectives on the use of fossil fuels and it's been pointed out he's not going out there preaching philosophy but he doesn't need to as he establishes credibility in this field the same way for example that celebrities like mark pellegrino and rucka rucka ali did and then people find out oh this guy's an objectivist when you ask him philosophic ideas well one of the great triumphs that Alex Epstein had wasn't Dennis Prager, although I'm sure he reached a lot of people that way. But to me, it was the Jordan Peterson interview. Magnificent. Great interview. If you haven't heard it yet and you're like, well, I don't listen to Jordan Peterson, give that one a listen. You will enjoy that. But, and here's my conflict, and maybe you can help me with this. Alex Epstein does eventually get into his personal story, but I haven't heard it. And the reason is, because it's a subscriber-only extra on the Daily Wire that Jordan Peterson has been working with lately. And I can't get myself to subscribe to the Daily Wire Plus. I, I, it's not just that Ben Shapiro is precisely one of those people who can't imagine that it's not an alternative of either religious devotion or hedonism. That's his option. Rationally selfish, that means... Go to the bar, pick up chicks while your wife and kids are at home. Right. He can't imagine rational self-assertion where you're, no, a rational man realizes my wife is more important than hot chicks confession. at the bar. What a hideous confession it is Jordan Peterson is making. Yes. So what you're saying is your perception of what selfishness would consist of is ignoring your wife, ignoring your higher value for some lesser value. Uh, what you're saying is your long-term happiness is better served by sh serving short-term hedonistic interests than it yes. would be by by, by seeking long-term higher values. No, he's he's saying that selfish. He's defining out of existence any real selfishness. That is yes. to say, the actual concern with your actual long-term self-interest. That concept is defined out of existence. It's inconceivable to him because he's bought into the Christian package deal. He's yes. read he's, the influences on him, whether it's you know Solzhenitsyn or Nietzsche or uh, all the other influences that he names, all have that same implicit notion. Egoism is evil, and uh, yes. there is no long-term uh, self-interest, a rational self-interest out there. Um, mm -mm. He needs to read Ayn Rand's essay, Causality versus Duty, oh. probably more than once so that yes. he understands <laughs> that what he calls selfishness is actually self-destructive behavior. Yes. Um, 
Yes, exactly right. Jeremiah in the chat, incidentally, is he's, apparently my question's resonating with him. He's like, the damn paywall. Is it moral to give the Daily Wire money to hear the rest of the story? That point about Ben Shapiro, it sounds like, well, he's a good man kind of trying to wrestle with things, but it's really, it's just a low and petty version of the idea there would be no morals without religion. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't think Christopher Hitchens initiated it, but he was one of the people who said, they tell me that without the Bible, they would go out and rape and murder people. I already rape and murder exactly the number of people that I want to rape and murder. <laughs> and that number is zero. Would, number zero. <laughs> without the Bible, are you telling me, Ben Shapiro, that you would go out and steal and abuse and rape and murder people, but because of the Bible, oh, okay, now you don't want to do that? Is that what you're telling me about your soul? Right. Now, of course, Christopher Hitchens believed that morality was sort of an emotional thing built into us, you know. It's yeah. almost like the religious people who thought that we had a conscience, a moral conscience implanted into us by God. A lot of these secular thinkers are just emotionalists at the end of the day. Yes. Our emotions inform us about morality. And But how do you then uh, answer the sadist or the criminal who's having these horrible emotions, uh, you know, the murderer, the rapist, the child molester? Uh, those people have emotions. And their emotions aren't guiding them to the right way. Obviously, he needed a deeper lesson in philosophy uh, to, to, to get that. But the point he makes is correct. When the, the, the person who said, <laughs> says that, yeah, uh, people would be out there raping and murdering and people aren't moral agents and therefore they need either a Leviathan state or they need God to tell them what to do and suppress their natural lusts and emotions. Uh, he makes a really great point there, doesn't he? Uh, yes. Emotions are the result of our values. If you really would just enjoy torturing people or abusing people or exploiting people or something, then that's telling me something about you, about what you think you're happy. I mean, think of it. That's a person whose values are messed up. That's a person who doesn't understand values at all. That's a person who's got psychological problems, not ideas, and they're taking them out on the rest of us. Yeah. Um, yeah, if the Bible is the only thing keeping you from going out and doing things, the Bible is also the only thing keeping you from seeking actual psychological help to resolve those conflicts. Precisely, or get, preventing you, blocking you, in fact, giving you the wrong answer and preventing you from seeing the correct way to go, your yes. long-term, rational, actual self-interest. So lest anybody think objectivists don't face enormous moral conflicts, I still haven't, I can't sign up for the Daily Wire. I loathe and despise everything that comes out of Matt Walsh's mouth. Andrew Clavin is contemptible in every way. Everybody associated with the Daily Wire. Ben Shapiro is actually the least bad, the least worst of them all. I'm a terrible I really want to hear asshole. Alex, I want to hear what Alex had to say to Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be available, you know, more broadly on YouTube later. Uh, these things often do. But I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm bad. I have a hard time subscribing to anything, really. You know, I, I my wife and I, we subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. And even there, I have moral qualms. And then the, the worst editorial comes out and you're like, we've got to cancel that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so somehow I, I hold my nose and I still subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so you see how far out I am about moral sanction. I, I haven't really been able to. Pay I haven't even so been I able to. I haven't even been able to get myself to go see Maverick, the new Top Gun film, because oh, people wow. are saying it's the best film that came out this year. It's, it's like so it, yeah. pro -hero pro heroism, pro America, pro technology, pro military. But it's Tom Cruise. How can I do anything that would put 12 cents into the pocket of Scientology? Fortunately, I can wait for it to come out on the subscription service. Yeah, right. Watch it, watch it on the money. big screen at home. <laughs> it's but tough being an objectivist in a crazy world. I mean, in general, if I had to use politics to filter the artists that I paid attention to, there'd be precious few artists that I, I would have see left anything. That I paid attention to. But at a certain point, if you know that a major chunk of this guy's income is going to the truly insidious cult of Scientology, right. it has to give you pause. Yeah. It really does. Am I supporting so ideas that are really worse in the long run than, say, my enjoyment of this in a theater? Yes, yes. And Daniel in the chat says, well, I find it morally impossible to stop supporting the ARC UK. 
Me too. Absolutely. And that's why I'm subscribed <laughs> both to the YouTube channel and to the ARC UK through membership. That link is at the very top of the chat. It's just pinned there. But if you've already dismissed it, just go to einrandcenter.co.uk. Now they're British. So center is spelled wrong with R-E at the end, like those British <laughs> people do. But einrandcenter.co.uk, click become a member at the top. Make sure that you sign on for that. It's the Christmas season. There is no better time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year to become a member of the ARC UK, become a member of the YouTube channel and put in those super chats. James, thank you again for another great discussion. But this one, this one is only half over because next week, again, how to change the world, that's going to be good. And I am looking forward to having that discussion with you. Coming up in an hour, we've got the daily objective goes live. And I had the topic on the tip of my tongue here, and I just lost it. Let me look it up real quick, because I remember it's going, all the topics are good this week. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, there, oh, we're doing Elon. Good. You need a philosophy with Elon Musk as the thumbnail. Well, I will be watching the Daily Objective at one o'clock Eastern time, six o'clock UK, wherever in the world you are around the world. See, we've got 24 hour content not because we've always got something going on, but because it's a big world with a lot of time zones. That's going to be a good one. The Daily Objective coming up in one hour. James, let's finish this discussion next week on the 28th, how to change the world. We'll take what we've talked about today in regard to technology and what objectivism looks like in the real world. And if there's going to be cause, not just for hope, but for celebration, we're going to find it next Wednesday. James, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was fun. See you next week. See you next week.